All of us should seek our own uh, faults and our own uh, shortcomings and then seek God for forgiveness. Uh, Many times we seek to find out the secret faults in others (laughs) uh, and judge them wrongly instead of seeking out our own faults and then seeking God for His forgiveness. You see, sometimes a small thing left unattended can become a big thing in our life. Small mistakes can eventually turn out and become big catastrophic moments in someone's life that hurts that person and those that are around them. Uh, One afternoon, a carpet layer had just finished installing carpet for a lady, and he stepped out for a smoke, only to realize that he didn't have his cigarettes, right? So he quickly goes back in, and in a fruitless search, he doesn't find his cigarettes, but he notices a bump under the newly laid carpet that he just laid. And he thought, oh, great. He said, you know, no use tearing up my work, tearing up the carpet to get my cigarettes. He said, I'll just get my mallet, and I'll pound them down to nothing. So he grabs his mallet, and he, he pounded that, that bump down in the carpet, you know, and he said, that takes care of that. I've saved myself a lot of time. Um, I can get me another pack of cigarettes. Uh, as he was getting his tools together, the owner of the house, the lady, came, and she said, are these your cigarettes? He's like, yeah, they are. She goes, I just can't find my parakeet. Can you help me? So, oops, my bad. <laughs> you know, sometimes we know when we've made a mistake, and sometimes we don't. We don't see it as a mistake until later. Uh, in the magazine Mental Floss, several years ago, they highlighted 20 of the greatest mistakes in history. And they included, uh, here, here are three of, of those greatest mistakes. Uh, the mistake that burned down London. Um, on the night of September 1st, 1666, notice how many sixes are in that, not good, 1666, the oven of the royal baker to the king of England sparked a fire. It wasn't a spectacular conflagration. It seemed to be like no big deal. Uh, but yet the fire from that little spark burned for five days and wiped out 13,000 homes, and 80% of the city of London was burnt to ashes. Then there's the mistake that sunk a ship. The passenger liner, the Titanic, sunk on its maiden voyage from England to the United States in 1912. The Titanic was known as the unsinkable ship, right? You thought I was going to say something else. (laughs) Sometimes the, 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 the mind works faster than the tongue. The unsinkable ship. Thank you very much. <laughs> they even boasted that not even God can sink this boat. I'm staying away from the S word, you know. Just, not even God can sink this boat. Like, does Pastor use that word? No, I do not. Um, the, the captain of the boat <laughs> was warned. They didn't get the warning in time that they're icebergs. They didn't heed the danger. You know the story. They hit the iceberg, 1,517 people lost their life. And then there's the mistake that killed John Wayne. Some of you don't know about this. Uh, Much of the filming for the movie, The Conqueror, was done in the Utah Snow Canyon, which was located 150 miles downwind from a nuclear test facility. At least 91 of the 220 people who were on the crew for the filming of that movie uh, contracted cancer, and half of those people died of cancer, including John Wayne. A spark jumps out of an oven. A baker fails to snuff it out. A ship that didn't, need, didn't heed the danger. Uh, a movie is filmed downwind of a nuclear facility. All of these are seemingly small oversights at the time. Errors, miscalculations that we don't tend to see as major mistakes. I believe the Bible encourages us to do some self-examination, to examine ourselves, not others. We become quite proficient at examining others, seeking out the secret faults of others. I think that's why tabloid magazines are so famous and so popular, because we like hearing about the shortcomings and the, the failures of others for some reason. It helps us maybe feel better about our own life. 
Yet the Bible, in the book of Psalms, the, psalm, the psalmist in Psalm 19.12 says that we are to confess our hidden faults. And we all have some hidden faults. We all have some secret faults. Let's talk about that for a moment. You know, this past Thursday, I had the privilege of sharing with our college students. And again, this coming Thursday night, if you're a college student, I invite you to come. We're doing a series, You Asked For It, questions that college people turned in, that I have formulated a message around those questions. And it's been, we've got great worship. It's just a great time. But uh, I opened up last week and I said, okay, I want everybody to know, if you don't like the sermon, don't blame me. Blame one of your fellow students that submitted the question because my sermon is based on the question. I said, but we're going to be talking about some heavy-duty stuff. So I want you to know this is a guilt-free zone. All right, and I want you to know this morning, this church, this service is a guilt-free zone. Because you see, guilt's not good. Guilt doesn't come from God. God doesn't use guilt. The enemy uses guilt. The enemy uses guilt, blame, and shame. All right? Uh, some of you uh, had mothers who had the gift of using guilt, <laughs> the gift of guilt. They just knew how to manipulate you with guilt. God doesn't use guilt. So this is a guilt-free zone. If you feel guilty <clears throat> today, any time throughout this duration of the message, it's not my fault, okay? It's the enemy trying to make you feel guilty. Religion is good at using guilt. But this is not a conviction-free zone. God doesn't use guilt, but God uses conviction. How many of you, from time to time in your life, you sense and you feel the conviction of God on your life? Raise your hand. If you didn't raise your hand, you should feel guilty. <laughs> okay? God uses conviction. Conviction is a good thing, not a bad thing. It's whenever we grieve the Holy Spirit in our life that we sense the conviction of the Holy Spirit in our life, and that's a good thing because it, it tells you something. It tells you that your conscience has not been seared as with a hot iron. The Bible talks about people who uh, their conscience has been seared with a hot iron, and so they've lost all sensitivity. You don't ever want to get to that place where you lose all sensitivity in your life. Conviction's good. See, America is in the mess it's in right now because the soul of our nation, the conscience of our nation, has been seared as with a hot iron. And so the deviant, abhorrent behavior and lifestyles and, and activities of people in our nation today, rarely does anybody ever uh, uh, speak out against it. Rarely does anybody even blush anymore at some of the things that we see and that we are witnesses of. Why? Because the soul of this nation, the conscience of this nation, has been seared as with a hot iron. So it's good when we feel a little conviction. That means that God loves us and he's at work in our life wanting to, uh, we're, we, as the potter, he's the potter, we're the clay, wanting to mold us and to fashion us into his image. So in this parable, this story, Jesus talks about a Pharisee and a tax collector. And there's everybody that's, that's gathered that day are listening to him because everybody loves a story and especially from the grand master storyteller himself, Jesus. And really the heart of this story, uh, he's addressing people who feel self-righteous and regard others with contempt. That's the problem with religion and religious people. Uh, religious people are, are, are full of self-righteous pride. There are different types of pride. All pride is wrong. All pride is sinful. All pride is evil. There's race pride, there is face pride, there is place pride, and then there's grace pride, uh, people that are prideful over their, their spiritual heritage. And all pride is wrong, whether it's race pride, people that are prideful over their, their race, uh, or people that are prideful over their face, you know, because they, they're more beautiful, or they're, they're this, or they're that, and they have this face pride. And then place pride is bad, too. And I know we happen to live in the best state in the nation. We happen to live in the best city in the best state in the nation. We have to deal with pride, place pride, but we bring it to the altar, we lay it there, we find forgiveness, and we move on. But the worst kind of pride is, is spiritual pride, um, where we are puffed up in our own good deeds. And uh, being good can get in the way of being godly if we're not careful. I'll say that again. Being good can get in the, living a good life can get in the way of living a godly life. Somebody needs to tweet that. That's right. What does that mean? 
That means there are moralists that are out there. There's nothing wrong with morality. There's nothing wrong with being a moral person. But when the motive behind that morality is to exalt yourself and make yourself think that you're better than everybody else or anybody else, and you're doing it so that you could break your own arm, patting yourself on the back, then that type of moral living stinks to high heaven in God's eyes. See, the Apostle Paul, he had race pride, he had face pride, he had place pride. And he talked about it in Philippians 3. He said, listen, this is before he gave his life to Jesus. He said, you all want to boast? You want to boast in what you've achieved, what you have accomplished in life? Let me tell you about myself. I am a Pharisee of Pharisees. I am an Israelite. I was born of the tribe of Benjamin. Concerning the law, I was flawless. I was the most zealous for the law of all my contemporaries. And then he says this. He says, but I consider all that a pile of rubbish. One translation says, a pile of garbage. <laughs> uh, the, the real word that he used, I consider it all a pile of dung con, uh, compared to the excellency of the knowledge of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All that we might be prideful over, all that we might boast in in our own lives of all of our achievements or accomplishments or future achievements or future accomplishments, when you pile them all up and you compare them to the excellency of the knowledge of knowing Jesus and serving Jesus and loving Jesus, all that stuff is just a pile of garbage. So what this story is about is not being puffed up in your own righteousness, but in the righteousness and the justification that can only come from others. And here's the deal. We tend, we tend as human beings, we tend to see ourselves above average. Uh, studies show that nine out of ten managers rate themselves as superior to their average colleagues. Did you know that 9 out of 10 college professors rate themselves higher and above average to all of their contemporaries? Now, this wasn't in the study, but I would venture to say 9 out of 10 pastors believe that their preaching is above average. And your silence does concern me a little bit. Uh, professor of psychology David Myers found in a study that most drivers, even those who have been hospitalized after accidents, believe themselves to be safer and more skilled than the average driver. That's the problem when we get out on the road. We all think that we're better drivers than we really are. You know, I was, uh, I was driving about yesterday, and I was thinking about the sermon, the message, and I was thinking about, as I was driving, I was thinking about, are there verses that could apply to us as, while we're driving? And, and, and there was this slow person in front of me. They were going like extra slow. And I thought, is there a verse for this person? And this verse came to my mind, get thee behind me, Satan. And I, I don't know where it came from. I know it's not right. I, I didn't, it's a misapplication of that verse. But I thought it. <laughs> or let's say that you need to get someplace really fast, and so you're speeding. I know you shouldn't, but you're speeding and you get pulled over, and the cop comes up to give you a ticket, and he says, why were you going so fast? Is there a verse that you could instantly recall and use? And there is one. When King David in 1 Samuel was fleeing from Saul, and he went to the high priest, and the high priest said, hey, where's your sword? And he said, I didn't have time to grab it because the king's business requires haste. <laughs> so when the cop says, why were you speeding? Say, the king's business requires haste. And he'll give you a ticket and say, have the king pay for it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> so we really think that we're better drivers than we really are. And many times we think that we are better humans, better Christians than maybe we really are. And here's the hard truth. Remember, guilt-free but not conviction-free. Here's the hard truth. You are more the saint than you are the sinner that others see in you, and you are more the sinner than you are the saint that you see in yourself. Is that a little bit too complicated? 
this early in the afternoon? <laughs> I'll say that again. You are more the saint than you really are the sinner that others see. You see, others look at you and they're like, you know, people me you work with, colleagues, whatever, they're like, family members are like, yeah, you're not that spiritual. You think you are, but, you, you know, we know you better. You're really not as bad as they say you are. And then you're really not as good as you think you are. We're somewhere in between that, which is the safe zone, okay? And so the Bible says not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, as God has dealt to everyone a measure of faith. So we're not to be puffed up. We're not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought, but we're not to think of ourselves more lowly than we ought. So there's the balance of somewhere in between, knowing that, that you are both saint and sinner. That's the conundrum of life. That's the proper tension of, of classical biblical Christianity. We know that we are, we are saints in the eyes of God because of the blood of Jesus and because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. But we also know that we still have this body of death uh, that we're united to, this fleshly, carnal nature of ours that is the Apostle Paul, the great Apostle Paul described in Romans chapter 7 when he said, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I do do. It says that in the King James. I'm not making that up. (laughs) You ever been there? The things you want to do, you don't do. The things you don't want to do, you end up doing. And so Paul raised his hands and said, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Then he finishes by saying, thanks be unto God through Jesus Christ. You see, we have the victory not in ourselves but in Jesus, and we don't trust in our own righteousness. We don't trust in our own righteousness but in the righteousness of God through and in Christ Jesus. You see, nobody could look down their nose at anybody else because none of us are any better than the next person. You may be, and thank God if you are, and we hope you are. We want to help you to be further along in your walk with Jesus this year than you were last year. Okay, uh, We want you to be further along in your walk with Christ next week than you are this week. That's why we attend church. That's why we get involved in life groups. That's why we are going to have a time of prayer and fasting tomorrow. We want everybody to participate. Maybe you work the night shift and you can't come at 6.30, but you can still fast a meal, two or three, tomorrow, right? And then we can all pray together. All of these spiritual disciplines help us to continue to to grow on the growth continuum, to become more like Christ. But uh, we're all all the same. We all have different struggles, different times. We're all at different levels spiritually. Nobody could look down their nose at anybody else and feel self-righteous and and show contempt for another human being. Because we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every single one of us in here have broken All Ten Commandments, some of you more than once in a daytime, in a given 24-hour period. You see, some people think, well, you know, I've I've never never committed adultery. No, no, Jesus said, if you've ever, for a split second, momentarily had a lustful thought into your mind, you're guilty of adultery before God. Whoa, don't look at me so guilty. We're all guilty. I've never murdered anybody. If you have ever felt enmity in your heart, momentarily, a flash of hatred, those of you that are married, you know what I'm talking about. (laughs) Can we be real? Then you've committed murder in the eyes of Jesus, in the eyes of God. He said that in the Sermon on the Mount. So let's just uh, even out the playing field here, okay? We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we're all sinners, but what makes us saints in the eyes of God, it's not what you do, it's not what you can do, it's not what you have done or what you intend to do. It's all because of what Jesus has done and the finished work of Christ on the cross of Calvary for you and me. And so we trust not in our own righteousness, but in His. So look at what it says now. Luke 18. um, By the way, in the Gospel of Luke, it's the Gospel of of the Great Reversal. Luke's Gospel is the Gospel of, of, of Great Reversals. What do I mean by that? The kingdom of heaven is introverted, right? Um, The Gospel of Luke is full of surprises. For example, the last are first. And people would scratch their head and say, I don't understand that. Yeah. If you want to be first, you have to be last. 
And if you're last, then you're really first. It's the great reversal. If you want to be exalted, you have to humble yourself. Because if you exalt yourself, you will be humbled. If you are honored by men, you're more than likely despised by God. But if you are despised by men, you are more than likely being honored by God. And so what Jesus does in this story is he, he brings everybody in by telling a story. And he thinks, see, and then everybody thinks that they know the outcome of this story. They, when Jesus said there were two men that went to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, one a tax collector, everyone's saying, I got this down. Pharisee, good guy. Tax collector, bad guy. But then Jesus reverses it and he flips it at the end of the story and he pulls out from underneath everyone's feet the theological rug that they were standing on. He pulls it right out from under them. So look at how, how, how it happens here. Luke 18, beginning verse 9. Then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, and the other was a despised tax collector. So what does that mean? That means he worked for the IRS, and uh, he intimidated people that believed in the Bible. And (laughs) No, it's been the same for 2,000 years. We think right away, oh, that's got to be the bad person, and the Pharisee has to be the good person. Look at verse 11. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. Notice it says the Pharisee did what? Say it with me. Stood by himself. What does that word stood mean? Well, he stood as opposed to what? Bowing, as opposed to kneeling. And this posture In the Pharisee, as described by Jesus, it speaks of pride, arrogance, self-exaltation, the desire to be seen by others that were in the temple, when really we should desire to be seen by God. Now, we don't know this for certain, but this could more than likely be something that Jesus experienced as a young boy going to the temple at the age of 12, something he could have experienced uh, going to the synagogue living in Nazareth as he went to the synagogue every Sabbath. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, I believe verse verse 17 or 13, it says it was the tradition of Jesus, it was his custom to go to church, go to the synagogue every Sabbath. It's what we do. We do what Jesus did. We come to the temple to pray. That's the good part of this story. Uh, The the Pharisees, the tax collectors of the world, we all convene at the house of God for what purpose? To pray to pray to commune with God, to connect with God. And yes, we can do that outside of church, but there's just something special that happens when we corporately come together. And you know what? After all of us, after living a week in this sin-benighted world of ours and being exposed to everything that we're exposed to and facing everything that we have to face, how many know we need to come to the temple to seek God on a Sunday like today to get our souls restored? Are you with me? So they are coming, and one, the Pharisee, is standing in spiritual pride and arrogance, and then Jesus gives us the prayer that perhaps he saw when he was 12 or when he was in the synagogues, or annually when he and his family would travel to Jerusalem to the temple to worship. Maybe he was a witness of this. We don't know where he saw this, but he also knew what was in the hearts of men So then here's what Jesus does. He actually gives us the prayer of this Pharisee. So uh, let me clear my throat and let me get my Pharisaical voice going here. Here's the prayer of the Pharisee. I thank you, God, that I am not a sinner like everyone else. For I don't cheat. I don't sin. I don't commit adultery. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give you a tenth of my income. Now, the prayer ends there, and this guy better be glad that that prayer ended there because I'm thinking God's in heaven thinking you say one more word, lightning, your toast, your french fries. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, you know, God's loving, but he has his limits. You know, you know he does. He has his limits. So the prayer ends there, and there are, there are prayers in the Bible we should imitate. There are prayers in the Bible we should repeat. There are prayers in the Bible we should pray, like the Our Father. But there are also prayers recorded in the Bible we should completely stay away from. And this is one of the prayers we should stay away from. 
Did you know that the Pharisee used the personal pronoun I or I'm eight times? I am this. I am that. I don't this. I don't that. I do this. I do that. Now, let me ask you something. The things that he described here, not being greedy, not being dishonest, uh, not committing adultery, fasting, giving God the tithe, do you think those are all admirable, noble virtues and, and characteristics that we should practice in our lives? How many, it's not a trick question. How many believe that those are all good qualities? How many of you that are not married yet, one day want to be married, how many of you, how many of you would like to marry someone who's not greedy, who's not dishonest, and who doesn't commit adultery? Only raise your hand. Okay. Um, those of you that, are, that run a business, how many of you would like to hire people who are honest, who are not greedy, and who are faithful to their marriage vows? How many of you would like to hire people like that? Raise your hand. Okay. So those qualities are good qualities, correct? But he was doing them for the wrong reason. It wasn't to draw closer to God. It wasn't because of a heart filled with devotion and love for God and wanting to please God. It's because of this self-righteous confidence that made him feel better than other people. You know, when we have to put other people down to make ourselves feel better about ourselves, we're in need of a lot of help, aren't we? And this is what he was doing. All right, so now let's contrast the Pharisee's prayer with the tax collector's prayer. Look at verse 13. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He wouldn't even get close to the altar or close to anybody else. And he dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. So in Scripture, we're, we are actually encouraged to look up, look up to the heavens, look up to God. But this guy was feeling so convicted that he would not even lift his eyes to heaven. Instead, it says, he beat his chest in sorrow. The Greek tense that's used for the Greek word in this sentence is in the imperfect tense. And what that means is, this was not a one-time thing, but the entire time he stood there at a distance in the temple seeking God's forgiveness for his life, he beat his chest the whole time. And here's the prayer that is recorded that he prayed, saying, and I want you to say this out loud with me, O oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. Let's say that again. O oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. And then how does Jesus conclude the story? I tell you this, sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. The, most, the thing that makes you the most attractive to God, the thing that makes you the most attractive to heaven is your humility. Not your humiliation, your humility. God does not want any human being to be humiliated. God's not in the humiliating business unless you are in the pride business. <laughs> Just read the story of King Nebuchadnezzar and what happened to him. God wants to lift you up. God wants to promote you. God wants to exalt you. But the only way he can do that is if you'll humble yourself. Because God resists the proud. Race, pride, face, pride, place, pride, grace, pride. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Look to your neighbor and say, he gives grace to the humble. Tell him that. Tell him he's given you more grace. Speak that over their life. He's given you more grace. Now, listen. I was going to name this sermon, How to Get Low to Get High. And then I realized that that would not go over very well. Not in this day and age. But there's a great theological, spiritual truth in that statement. The way to get high is first to get low. And then God will lift you up. The tax collector got low, so God lifted him up. The Pharisee got high, so God humbled him. You see, two people could come to church 
And one leaves with something and the other leaves with nothing. One leaves with forgiveness or the restoration of their soul and the other one lives, leaves the same way, maybe even worse than when they came in because they're blinded by their own pride. Small mistakes that could eventually lead and become greater mistakes that we need to seek our own seek out our own secret faults not somebody else's but our own and then seek forgiveness from God i know there's some crazy doctrine out there it seems to circulate every every so many years where people are saying if you're a christian you don't ever even you don't you don't ever have to confess your sin because god's grace is sufficient which it is all error all error is based on truth but it's a half truth and a half truth is a whole lie there are people that say oh you never ever have to worry about sin ever again and you never even have to confess your sin because the grace of god covers you from all sin and that's just a bunch of hogwash okay you know the bible says he that says he has no sin is a liar <laughs> okay so now you got two two problems the your original sin and now you're adding to it with lying okay And the Bible encourages us to humble ourselves before God. Not to see yourself as a worm of the dust, to see yourself in who you are in Christ, but to also see yourself apart from Christ and know that we are all one step away from the goodness and grace of God if we give in to uh, the temptations of the world and, and the carnal nature that we all contend with. But to be humble. And the Bible says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Because small things can become big things left unchecked. Small things can become big things. A spark that burns down a city. A warning that wasn't heeded that sinks a ship. Or a movie that's filmed downwind from a nuclear facility. Oversights that can become catastrophic events in someone's life. It's the little foxes that spoil the vine, the Bible says. So here are three big takeaways for us from this story in Luke's Gospel, chapter 18. Number one, this is a, a mistake. It's a big mistake when we make unwise comparisons. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10, 12, they that compare themselves among themselves are not wise. You should never get into the business of comparisons because you'll always end up on the short end of the stick or you'll, somebody else in your own uh, eye will end up on the short end of the stick. Never compare yourself to other people, to other individuals, to other situations. Be content with where you are and with who you are, with who God is making your, ma- making your life out to become, to be. Be content that you were created in the image and likeness of God that you are his child, that he loves you. Be content that there's nothing that you could do today to cause him to love you any more. There's nothing you could do today to cause him to love you any less. And knowing that doesn't make us want to take advantage of God's goodness or God's grace. If anything, it, it just drives us to a greater heart of humility and dependency upon him. You don't ever have to compare yourself to anybody else because you, just the way you are in God's eyes, are perfect. You're not complete yet. He's still bringing about change and transformation in your life. He's the potter. You're the clay. You're on his table. He's working you. He's forming you. He's fashioning you. Be content with who you are right now, knowing that God is not going to leave you the way you are. He's changing you from the inside out. Don't compare. Here's the second mistake that we make is when we begin to rely on our own righteousness. Look at Isaiah 64, 6. I, I just read this verse because in my daily devotional reading through the Bible in the year, I'm, I just finished out Isaiah, and it says this. I love this. We are all infected and impure with sin when we put on our prized robes of righteousness. We find they are but filthy rags. You see, my own righteousness, your own righteousness, your religious righteousness, my religious righteousness, your denominational righteousness and my denominational righteousness, uh, your, your uh, doctrinal righteousness and my doctrinal righteousness are like filthy rags. They stink to high heaven. The righteousness that we want to be clothed with 
is the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And the moment we give our life to Jesus, we're justified. We are justified just as if I'd never sinned. It is a complete, finished work. Once you've been justified at the cross of Calvary, you never have to be re-justified because you don't get unjustified, okay? What you have to go through is a process now of sanctification of every day growing to become more like Jesus. I just finished reading through the book of Hebrews, and Hebrews 12, 11 says this, to be at peace with all men and to pursue holiness without which no one shall see the Lord. You see, we are motivated to pursue holiness, not so we could feel puffed up and, and feel self-righteous and, and show contempt to others. And church, we have to be careful. We have to be careful that we don't become a church filled with Pharisees, a Pharisaical church, that we look down our noses at others who are not living like we're living. How many know that we need to feel pity for the people in the world that are lost in sin right now? Because how many know we used to be out there too? And you know, you know why sinners sin? Sinners, sinners, people aren't sinners because they sin. They sin because they're sinners. <laughs> it's their nature to sin. And when you're lost and undone and away from Christ, you don't know that what you're doing is wrong and evil. In love, we have to point them to the truth. In love, we have to share the good news of the gospel, that God didn't create you for that. God made you for, in his image, in his glory. God made you for a, a greater purpose. He has a plan for your life that we're all sinners, myself included, and we need to all come to the foot of the cross because, listen, the highest place, the highest place any human being could ever find themselves, the highest place is not the Sears Tower in Chicago. It's not Mount Everest. The highest place, spot is not the presidency of the United States of America. The highest spot, the highest place that any human can get to is a hill called Calvary, right outside of Jerusalem, where the glorious Lord and Savior Jesus Christ hung on that cross and shed his blood and died so that we could know God's forgiveness and so that we could have eternal life and so we don't trust in our own righteousness but in his righteousness that once you get saved he gives you and clothes you with it and the final thing is not receiving God's abundant grace once again those who exalt themselves will be humbled Jesus said and those who humble themselves will be exalted I'd like every head bowed every eye closed I'd like you to place your right hand over your heart. And just say this, these words with me once again. Oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. Thank you for your grace at work in my life. I'm not where I want to be, but I'm not where I used to be. Thank you that you're changing me from glory to glory from faith to faith, not so I could look down at others, but so I could look up to the risen Savior. For greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Now with heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here today, and you've never accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, he's standing at the door of your heart knocking right now. If you will open up the door of your heart and receive Christ into your life, you will know his forgiveness. You could leave the temple today justified. You could leave with the assurance that heaven will be your eternal home, that you'll spend eternity with God in heaven by surrendering your life to Christ. If you'd like to do that, I will lead you in a prayer, and the rest of the congregation will pray this prayer with you. But I challenge you to say it with your own mouth. Mean it from your own heart. Say these words, Dear God in heaven, I know I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. There's only one Savior. His name is Jesus. I call upon you, Jesus. I ask you now, come into my heart. Come into my life. Be my Lord and be my Savior. Give me grace to live for you and serve you all the days of my life. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can we thank the Lord together, church family? Hey, we love you. Have an awesome day.